driving around. This is after Skin Tight came out. I'm driving along, around, and, and there's these billboards on the interstate in Miami, and it said, it, it says, "Come see Dr. Lips, L-I-P-S. Come see Dr. Lips." And it was a real doctor had taken out these billboards. And because I know you all, if you're like me, that's where you look for your medical care. <laughs> He's on highway billboards. And, and you especially look for someone who's named themselves after the body part they want to work on. My name is Gregory McCormick, and I am the manager here of the cultural programming uh, department at the Toronto Reference Library. Uh, we're very happy to have you all here to uh, welcome uh, Carl Hyassen and, of course, uh, Linwood Barkley. So, the first thing I'd like to say about our host tonight is that Stephen King is one of his biggest fans. <laughs> now, that means a lot. I mean, if, if, if uh, Stephen King is writing blurbs on the back of your, your book, uh, you know you've you, uh, done something right uh, in your writing. So uh, that's very impressive. And he's actually been uh, associated with the library for a long time. In fact, he's interviewed Ian Rankin right here on this very stage. And he has been interviewed himself uh, uh, for several times here at, at the Appel Salon. Uh, he is the New York Times and number one international best-selling writer of uh, many critically acclaimed novels, including No Safe House, um, the, the book for which he was interviewed here, A Tap on the Window, and Broken Promise, which is the first book in his Promise Falls series. The second was called Far From True. And the newest, the latest, the third one, it's called The 23. It will be published by Doubleday Canada in November. Uh, so mark that on your calendars. And uh, let's welcome Linwood Barkley. Oh wow, this is great. Um, so I was, I was about, I, I was thinking it was like two or three years ago that I got to interview Carl Hyacin here before. And then I looked and saw that the book that I interviewed him for was Star Island, which came out in 2010. I thought, whoa, you know, I had one of those old person moments, like, really? Six years has gone by. But, but it was such a great event, you know, great event, for, particularly for me, because I have been just an immense Carl Hyacinth fan since I would be, as I probably said then, working the overnight shift on the city desk at the Toronto Star, reading tourist season and uh, all these others to keep me awake through that, that shift. So I was a real fanboy then. I was just incredibly excited. Now I get to interview him again. It's not as big a deal this time. Um, <laughs> I've done it once, uh, but you know, but, but uh, he really has been one of my all-time favorites, so it really is great to talk to him. And Razor Girl is the latest. I mean, no way to diminish any other book of Carl Hyacinth's. Uh, Razor Girl is one of my absolute favorites. And it doesn't even have skink in it. Um, no, no, don't be like that. It's really good. Even, and skink's got his own book, right? Skink's got his own book for young adult readers, which does not mean you are not allowed to read it. Um, so it's, I think it's about, and it's also, I think, Razor Girl is just about the best title of any book this year, I think. I just, it's got such a zing to it. And I, and I, would, I would leave, I will leave it to Carl to explain why that title works and what it means, because I, I can't, I'm far too delicate to tell you why, I, why that's such a great title. Um, we have the better part of an hour. I want to spend at, the, at, at least five minutes talking about Razor Girl before I try to steer Carl to talk about what he's been writing about so much in his Miami Herald column of late, the US presidential election. <laughs> Oh, he doesn't, maybe not? Oh, no. You know, in general, and in particular, perhaps one Donald Trump, or as Bill Maher called him the other night, Orange Hitler. Um, <laughs> actually, but I thought that was not bad, but it was, in fact, I believe it was Carl who said that uh, Donald Trump gets his hair from the underarms of orangutans. Is that right? <laughs> With no further ado, Carl Hyacinth. When Ian Rankin was here and I talked to him, I had all these questions ready. I don't think we got to any of them. Um, I can't even begin to describe the plot of Razor Girl. <laughs> um, and if I tried to, yeah. I feel that I would not do it justice. And not, like this is, I think, a tough, you know, we talk about elevator pitches. 
I don't know, I would, you'd have to be in a really tall building <laughs> to get all of the magnificent plot points and stories and everything that's going on in this book. But why don't you give us that pitch? We'll go up to like the 70th floor. Yeah, well, I'll try to, there's no simple way because it's just the product of a chaotic mind. But uh, it's, I'll tell you how it starts and then how it ties in. Um, I, br I bring back the character who was in a novel called Bad Monkey, the, the, the lead guy. I've never done it in two consecutive novels. A Andrew Yancey was this cop down in the Key West area, and he, he lost his badge due to some personal issues that were uh, publicly revealed. <laughs> and uh, in front of 2,000 cruise ship passengers, he, he got carried away. Anyway, so the, the sheriff didn't want to, he fired him. He said, look, it, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll get you a job as a health inspector. Uh, and what we call in Florida the Roach Patrol. You inspect restaurants, the kitchens of restaurants. And so now you got this guy who once was a hotshot detective and he's counting, you know, roach wings in, that he finds in the restaurant food. And I kind of left him there at the end of Bad Monkey. And I, it was one of the few times I felt kind of crummy that, that I had. I mean, I thought, God, the poor guy, he didn't really make it. So I thought I'd give him another shot and, and, uh, and Razor Girl. But I had... Uh, you know, you always worry about, and Linwood will tell you this, the beginning of the novels are kind of important, you want, especially if you have a background in newspapers where you're trained to, to grab the reader early on in the lead, you mean from the very first page, because in newspapers you don't have much time to get their you know, attention uh, at what newspapers remain. Uh, you'll see that people do try, you know, you, you, there's a certain pace to it. So I had, I had this clipping that my um, oldest son had, had sent, emailed me, and he always sends me this sick stuff. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why. He said, you know, Dad, have you seen this? It's like, hint, hint, you know. So this was a, this was a, real, there was a real car accident that happened down in, in the Lower Keys, about 20 miles out of Key West, if you've ever been there, down, going down the Overseas Highway, which is the only road in and out, 55 miles an hour, a car full of, innocent tourists, if there is such a thing as an innocent tourist, um, <laughs> they're, they're struck from behind at high speed by another vehicle, and the cops, this is what really happened, and the cops get there and uh, find out why, you know, why the other car hit this car, and it goes back and looks at the car, the driver of the, of the offending vehicle, and it, it's a woman, and uh, she was distracted while driving because she was doing some personal grooming at the time <laughs> with a razor, and... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the, the newspaper, because we all work for a family newspaper, they were said they, they were, this is as delicate as they could get. They said she was shaving her bikini area while driving. Um, in most places, texting while driving is the problem, but not in South Florida. So. It's hard to imagine an ad campaign based around that. You know? No. Public service announcement, sorry. Yeah, no, but anyway, so I, I, of course I saved the clipping and I had it on a, a cork board and you know, there were two questions. Could I, could I, how do I get it into a novel? And how can I, how can I improve on it in, in a novel? Then, I mean, the story itself. So um, in my novel, in Razor Girl, there's an accident like that, except that it's not really an accident. It's a staged crash, which we also have an abundance of in South Florida because we have insurance scammers. And, they, their job is crashing into people on, on purpose. And uh, they do it for the, to settle insurance claims because there's, it's, nobody wants to, they just write them a check and say, sorry, your neck hurts, you know, whatever. The, but, they, but the people do that. So I thought I would kind of combine the two and start the novel that way. And then the next question becomes, so who does she crash into? This is, and this woman sort of is one of my favorite characters in the book. She calls herself Mary Mansfield. And, she's, uh, and, and she says, I'm not just a, a good driver, I'm a performance artist. She's very proud of the dexterity, as you can imagine, of trying to drive. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe you can't imagine, but just think about it. <laughs> you could hurt yourself. So anyway, she crashes into a guy, and it turns out it's not the right guy. She got, it was, a, it was driving the exact same rental car. She was looking for a particular guy she'd been hired to crash into, and this is not the guy. The guy that she crashes into is a... Oh boy, the elevator's taking a while, isn't it? I'm working. I was going to say, so we're, we've already been up and down twice. Yeah, but that's fine. Just keep going. All right, anyway, well, this will get you back into it. Anyway, it'll be, I'll show you how Yancey gets involved in this. Anyway, so she crashes into a guy. He turns out to be a Hollywood talent manager from Hollywood, California. He's rushing to Key West to babysit his star client, who's a guy named Buck Nance. And Buck and his brothers are stars of a big 
a redneck reality show and, and, the, and called Bayou Brethren. And uh, uh, it's, the, it's the next generation beyond Duck Dynasty. It's the, it's the next sort of Neanderthal step beyond that. And, uh, and, and Buck, of course, is not a real redneck. He and his brothers were all bad accordion players from Wisconsin. And, but they had the beard and the look, and they, so they said, you guys, you want to be in a redneck reality show? They said, that's great. And they trained him. They got a Cajun dialect coach, uh, and uh, they put him on a rooster farm down in central Florida. And now they're the huge stars. And Buck starts to believe his own press clippings, and he starts to say things that are politically incorrect because he kind of thinks that that's what's expected of a character like him. And uh, they're using him to promote the show in some soft markets. And because of its diversity, South Florida is not a good market for this show. And he gets some bad intelligence about Key West. Uh, he thinks that that would be a good place to go tell some jokes, uh, the worst kinds of jokes you can imagine. So the, <clears throat> the book opens with uh, his manager has been waylaid by this car, the car crash. Buck's on stage in Key West. He tells some extremely inappropriate jokes. The mob turns, the crowd turns to a mob. He's running through his life to the streets of Key West. He says, who told me to come here and be this guy? And then he rushes into the back of an open door in an alley, and it turns out the back of a restaurant. And he's, he says, they, they know me because of my beard. He's afraid of being recognized. So he grabs a little pair of herb scissors that's lying in the kitchen, <laughs> and he just hacks his whole beard off into this uh, vat of quinoa that was seen. <laughs> yeah, pretty tasty. Anyway, I'm speeding it up. Yancey gets a call in the middle of the night. You got to get to the, you're not going to believe what's in this quinoa. You, we need you. Because uh, Buck has disappeared, and Yancey is basically a crime scene, in, in a way, if you think about it. And that's how the whole thing gets rolling. I don't, I don't, you don't have to applaud. It's, again. And what's, what's really amazing about this is that's basically the first 15 pages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's so much that happens yeah. to set the stage. Now, when you've, when you've, you've established this, uh, this, you know, you've got the Duck Dynasty kind of guy, and you've yeah. got your, dis, your morally bankrupt Hollywood uh, promoter guy, and the thing that's funny is that, what does it say about all the characters in the book, that Razor Girl is really the one who's probably the most likable and most heroic in many yeah. ways. Yeah, no, I, she is. She's really got, in her own way, the most integrity. She's got the most, she's, right? she's yeah. a, she, as, as, you know, you go on to not to ruin it, but she becomes one of the people that, she's a good person in yeah. her own way. In her own way. In the way that yeah. sort of Tony Soprano had a code, I suppose. But I mean. Everybody's got a code. But, but this happens so much. So when you start working on a novel like this, and it's like you're putting every possible absurdity from Florida you could think of into a blender, and then you just hit pulse, like just like full speed. I mean, yeah. when, when you're working on a book like this, how much of it have you figured out, or do you just figure once you throw all these people into the mix, it's going gonna, it's gonna to write itself? Yeah, I, don't, I have no idea what's going to happen yeah. when I start the books. It's a, it's a horrible thing if there's young writers in the room. I'm not a role model for how, how to do the book. <laughs> Uh, I, I have, uh, like you, I have an affinity for characters, and, and I have to, I start with a sort of a, an idea of a cast, of some people, the cast, and also I have ideas that I've got from the newspaper, I'd like this to happen and that to happen, and I build the cast around. And I, I sort of tell people, it's like, I know, I know um, there's a diving board there, and I know I'm going off the diving board, but I just don't know how far it is till I hit the water necessarily, and, and, I, and, and so it's stressful because I'm have, you know, the, I, I'm taking the lead, if this makes any sense, from some of the characters. I want to be surprised. I don't want to be locked into an outline. It's like handcuffs to me. I want to be able to change directions. I want to be able to get rid of a character who's like a drag all of a sudden. I want to get the hook out. I got to get the hook out. I don't want to change the outline. I want to be able to change directions with the character. So about two thirds of the way through the manuscript is when I pretty much have it all figured out. But beyond that, it's just, you know, uh, it's just kind but, of running. But beyond telling a wickedly funny, great story, I always feel that, that you've got something to say as well. I mean, I, I think 
under all of this humor is, is somewhere there's a really angry man. Pissed off. Who's yeah. pretty pissed totally off, pissed off. <laughs> yeah. about so many, so many things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and some of them I want to touch on, but not the least of which is, for, let's start with, these, with the sort of Duck Dynasty character, and what I would yeah. call this, uh, this celebration of ignorance and yep. stupidity that yep. we have now. Because when you were here before, we kind of touched on the Kardashians and how oh, here were people who were famous for being famous who contributed nothing in any way whatsoever. No. And now, we, and this trend I see since you were here last has only exploded. It has. Yeah. I mean, and there's a certain voyeuristic aspect. Some people who watch these shows do it because they're just, their jaws drop at how goofy the people are. And others are identifying with it. And that's the danger. And that's what happens in this book, mm -hmm. uh, especially being like a white guy from the South. And I was born in Fort Lauderdale, and you can't get much more Southern than that. Um, and, you know, in our country, we, we have this, uh, you know, sort of this idea that redneck is a Southern thing, when in fact, every state in the Union has what I would call redneck. I grew up with them, and, and I, you know, certainly probably have on occasion behaved like them. But that's one thing just to be in the outdoors and cussing and fishing and hunting and all that. It's another thing to carry this little subtext of intolerance and bigotry and, uh, and just out and out racism around. And, and, that, and there's become a code for that sort of behavior. I mean, there's code words, there's, there's you know, uh, just, there's a whole, almost an insignia to it. And, and, it's, it, and now it's, be, when I started writing this Buck Nance character as a guy who was just wanted to be on TV and then he started believing, they gave him a fake church and he's a fake deacon on the show, so he can get up and make fake sermons and, uh, and all that. And I'm inventing this silly stuff, and then the manuscript is turned in, and you turn on, then I, you know, it's, I'm done with it, right? And then I turn on the Republican National Convention in July, <laughs> and one of the kickoff speakers is one of the Duck Dynasty dudes. Here's a guy, this, guy, he, he, this is a guy that all these supposedly, you know, poor, uh, blue-collar, white American people are identifying. This guy's a millionaire because he's on a show behaving like a redneck. And I, all I, I got pissed off again because I didn't think of having my character address the Republican National Convention. <laughs> it wouldn't have ever occurred to me, and yet here it is. They had, they had Scott Baio, too. They did well. Yeah, you know? they did. Oh, that was a great... Yeah. But isn't that one of my, one of my all-time favorite... Writers is Calvin Trillin. Yes, and Calvin talks about Calvin Trillin talks about the the difficulties of writing satire because there's always the risk yeah. of what you write to mock someone or something will be overtaken by actual events. And it usually happens in Florida. I mean, that's just happened to me more than once. Yeah, he, he calls it being blindsided by the truth. And, right, and that strikes me as what if that becomes in in this kind of world that we're living in now, difficult to find ways that, that I have to also have to mention, when I was reading your columns on the, on the Miami Herald website, I noticed that they labeled it, there was the one that you wrote about uh, Donald Trump's alternate convention speech. Yes. And, and the Herald made the point of lab, putting a label parody. Oh, I didn't even see that. It says parody because you just know that, that, that because any attempt to, to, uh, to satirize will be overtaken oh, by something yeah. that I should say. So people would read that and think, well, he probably said this. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, when you have to start labeling it, that you know your readership is, uh, is in serious decline. <laughs> uh, when you have to start explaining that a 12-year-old would know it was satire, but apparently we don't have enough. Uh, oh, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, the, uh, it is hard. That is the challenge. It's always a challenge when you're writing this stuff and you think you've invented something so, you know, twisted that uh, this, it'll stand on its own for years to come as some, you know, depraved inspiration that you've had. And then, and then it's surpassed by a headline two weeks later after it appears. So, yeah, that's, and that's another source of stress when you do this kind of writing as, because the whole craft of it over traditionally is sort of to, to, is to take something that might happen and make it seem less outrageous than it really is. And then you have, you know, Donald Trump comes along. So now how do you deal with this as a, as a writer? Of, say, the column is easy because, you know, you, but it, it, when you're creating fiction that's going to be around for a while, I mean, I always tell people this is like, uh, Tom Wolfe c couldn't have invented Donald Trump, or if he had invented him. And, well, and if you had put, if you had 
10 years ago had wrote a character like that who was and described a presidential bid like that, probably your editors would say it's too over the top, no one will believe yeah, it. Yeah, he's never going to run and he's never going to win and he's never going to be, you know, they, I mean, they would just say, oh, this, now it's just gotten silly. You cross the line from sort of this sharp satirical edge to being silly and, and silly is where we're at in mm -hmm. the United States right now. And so again, yeah, it's, it's, it's discouraging when you're trying to, to, to write something that's out there far enough that it's going to endure for any period of time. And I've had it happen you know, with other stuff I've written that uh, I just, uh, you know, I thought this is, you know, I did a novel called Skin Tight. And I thought I invented the worst plastic surgeon of all time. And I had worked on an investigation for the Herald on bad doctors and, and, and my, my first wife had been, worked for a plastic surgeon and he had given me some stories, you know, and I thought, but I just took it and ran with it and invented this guy, Rudy Graveline, the worst plastic surgeon ever. And it, I mean, the, scene, the old book opens with him killing somebody during a nose job. He kills a patient <laughs> while he's giving him a nose job, which actually happened. Um, so I thought this is the best. And then like within months, there are headlines in the Herald about atrocities that are much you know, we, we had this guy, uh, I was driving around, this is after Skin Tight came out, I'm driving along, around and, and there's these billboards on the interstate in Miami, and it, said, it, it says, come see Dr. Lips, L-I-P-S, come see Dr. Lips. And it was a real doctor had taken out these billboards, and because I know you all, if you're like me, that's where you look for your medical care, <laughs> is on highway billboards. And, and you especially look for someone who's named themselves after the body part they want to work on. So, you know, his specialty was the collagen injections in the lips, but he would do anything. And you, I saw these for a while, and I'm thinking, God, I didn't even think to have my character have billboards, you know, it's, you know Dr. Boobs or whatever up there. So, uh, and then, um, then so he ends up getting arrested at some point, shockingly, in Miami. But, I mean, he, he had, the, he, the guy had come to him, seen the billboard, come to him and said, hey, um, I, would, I would love to get my lips done, but I also want my face done, cheeks, if you could do the neck, if you could do my eyelids. And he goes through the whole thing, and he says, then he ends up with this. And, and, I, and then also moving down the body, there's a part of me that I would like uh, a little bit bigger to surprise my my girlfriend back in South America. And uh, Dr. Lips says, fine, I can do all of that, and I can do it in one afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so everything starts out, and you know, I guess he starts up here, and now all this is going, he does the face, the lips, he does all, he works his way down to, you know, really, in my view, the most important part of the afternoon. And, um, and then uh, they say on Fox News, something goes terribly wrong. <laughs> and uh, the patient expires on the operating table. And uh, again, you got to be the worst eulogy of all time. Uh, I don't know what you say. I don't, you don't even know if they can get the casket closed at this point. So, um, but anyway, this is a... This is all stuff that, I, I, again, it pisses me off because I never dreamed of uh, having anything like that happen in the novel. And now it's in the headlines. It just, it's well, you've got, there's a couple of, there's at least one thing in the new book that I'd like to know if this is taken from any actual event or this was, also, was oh, from the product of your depraved imagination. Yeah. And that's the guy who's, who's had a, an interesting side effect uh, after taking erectile dysfunction yeah. medication. Yeah. But what happens to him is well above the waist. And yeah. he starts to have unusual <laughs> protuberances yeah. growing yeah. in his armpit. Yeah. Now, for, for, yeah. Which Fle I have to say, yeah, really conjured up an image that was hard to lose. I no, <laughs> I apologize in advance for that. Well, I had the idea because if you if in, in if you watch a lot of sports, at least in the United States, you can't watch a sporting event and not have like 15 ads for some sort of erectile dysfunction cure, and and uh, and one of them, you know, uh, especially golf for some reason. There's so <laughs> Golf is, apparently there's a connection. Anyway, and uh, having played golf, I, I, it, it's enough to wreck that part of your life, too. But, but anyway, there was, one, there was a product that was out for a while, that, that I, and I saw this ad, and it was this 
this cream, this cream that men smear on themselves, rather than taking the pills, you, and you put it in your armpits. And I thought, man, well, why not just make it a deodorant while you're at it? Just a, 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 it's, it fixes erectile dysfunction and you smell good. So I, I mean, so I invented this product in the novel called Pitrolux. And, and, and there's some side effects, and, and I've got a lawyer in here uh, who, who does these ads. You, you have them here in Canada, too, where they come on and they grimly recite all the side effects <laughs> of this thing. And if you've ever taken this product, and if you ever had any of these side effects, call us right away and sue. We're going to sue for you. So in the book, the guy who's doing the ads, he's a Miami lawyer, and he doesn't, he's not even a litigator. He just farms out the cases to real lawyers. And, but he's, he's been sent a case of Pitrolux to use as a prop in his infomercials, you know. And one night he's just not doing anything, and he looks at it and starts looking at it and then reading the label and going, what, what the heck? I mean, it can't be as bad. He thinks it's, you know, all that, the lawsuits are BS anyway. So he starts using the stuff, and he starts smearing it on him. And, uh, and it, as they say on Fox News, things go terribly wrong. And... Um, <laughs> Now, the side effect that, that Linwood is referring to, yeah, the little fleshy gross, uh, no, I, that was just my own sick imagination. I don't know if that's a side effect of that stuff or not, but I thought if you're smeared it, I mean, anywhere, it, it could be alarming. <laughs> so, you know, that was just some sick thing. But now, now you got me worried that I'm going to pick up a newspaper and read that somebody who's using this, you know. Yeah, I think it'll be this weekend. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they... There's a couple of other things in, in the book that I know are, are true because you've, you've talked about them and you've worked them yeah. into the book, so you haven't been overtaken, but you've used them. And a couple of them are, are one, of, one of the things that you've written about a lot, and it's particularly in books that have involved skink, are your concerns about the, the ecology and the environment in Florida. And, and one of the scum buckets in this <laughs> book yeah. is running a, a kind of a scam where, I mean, I guess because of rising sea levels, yep. this is getting eroding and getting rid of beaches. And yeah, so we're losing our beaches. Yeah. Losing your beaches. So this guy is stealing sand from other beaches to mm -hmm. put on other people's beaches. Yeah, if you pay him to do that. You pay him. Yeah, and but that's a real business. That's a real business. Yeah. It's called beach, we call it beach renourishment. It's, it's a huge, <laughs> I swear. Yeah, I'm not making that part up. It's a huge business in Florida because even when a hurricane comes, or, or even in the wintertime when you have a northeast swell, the beaches are disappearing. The, the oceans are rising. Parts of Miami Beach are underwater on certain high tides right now. Uh, parts of A1A in Fort Lauderdale, uh, the, the main beach road. But, um, so, but for years, these communities panic and resorts panic because beaches are a big commodity. It's an mm. expensive thing. And when your beach is so you can call a company up uh, and you say, look it, I need 50 more feet of beach, and they'll, they'll either dredge it up offshore, they'll get a permit, and they'll dump something approximating sand on the, on the beach, or they were getting it from the Bahamas, and I still think they do get it from the Bahamas. They barge it over from the Bahamas, which has very nice beach, which apparently they're happy to sell. So um, anyway, so that's a, real, that's a real deal down there, but I wanted a guy, and this guy in the book, Trubeau, he runs a, a company called Sedimental Journeys, and and he, but he's, he takes shortcuts. He, he, it's expensive to barge in really good sand. So he finds this out in West Dade County, outside of Miami, we have these big rock pit operations. And he, got, he gets someone to grind up some of the rock pit fill. And it looks close enough. And he puts it on a beach that happens to belong to a resort that's owned and operated by the, the mafia, the American mafia. And, and they, they have some nice properties in Florida, and uh, this is one of them, and, and it's beachfront. But they notice one day that after the new beach has been put down, that the, their guests are running back toward the lobby with their feet bleeding, and um, there's apparently some broken glass and other debris in the, in the sand. And, and they're pissed because, and, and they've realized they've been sold a bad beach. And they, and they go after Trubeau. And in fact, the beginning of the book, that's who Mary's supposed to be taken out with the car, is this guy. She gets the wrong car. But the, 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 the beach renourishment thing, it's such, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's the best job in the world. When you think about this, the, every beach that you lay down this summer is going to be gone, and, and, or at least a certain amount of it will be gone by next summer because nature doesn't give a rat's ass. It's just going to go ahead and do what it does and take it away. And so you get another phone call saying, hey, we need more beach. And it just keeps happening. And it's, it's, 
it's this arrogance that we have as sort of as a species that we think we can control or manipulate or manage nature, and you really can't. It's, a, it's an uphill. There's a certain amount of destruction we can do, and then at some point it, they'll, they, we're going to turn around and get our asses kicked, and uh, now, that's what's happening in Florida. Speaking of rat's ass, yeah. Uh, the other thing that's in this book, yeah. which you say in, your, in, the, in an author's note at the beginning, which might sound absurd and made up, is in fact true, and those true. are the the Gambian pouched rats? Giant Gambian pouched rats. Giant Gambian pouched Tell yeah. us about those. They're real. Um, they're, they, they, some of you probably have owned, well, I see some people nodding like they've owned them before. <laughs> um, I, I first heard about these when I was living down in the Keys, that um, they're, an, they're a species obviously not from the Keys, they're from Gambia, and they find them in Zen Senegal and Morocco, and it's the world's largest species of rat, and they can grow up to about nine pounds. Think about a nine-pound rat. So um, it's always fascinated me because there'd be little things in the news, Keys newspaper saying there'd be a sighting of a Gambian pouch rat here or there, and, I, and they'd been released in the Keys. So I thought, man, this, and it intrigued me, and I thought one day I'm going to work it into a novel. And so with Yancey being a restaurant inspector, I thought, well, what a, if he, he needs kind of a special adversary, and I th imagine him. <laughs> going into this kitchen late at night and you come face to face with a giant Gambian... Uh, but, but, but I have to give a little history about the rats. The way they got into the United States was some genius thought that the, the uh, Americans would love to own as pets rats that you had to walk on a leash. And so they started importing these things in the late 70s. And uh, the federal, they, turns out they carry a horrible disease called monkeypox, believe it or not. That's true. You can look it up. And the Fed stepped in and said, no, no, you can't bring these in anymore. Well, at this point, there's this poor guy down in Marathon, Florida, in the Keys. Who, I, I call him, if nothing else, an optimist, because he had imported a bunch of these giant, giant Gambian pouch rats and, uh, and was breeding them. He had a little colony, and then he gets the bad news that, sorry, you're not going to be able to sell them. No pet store is going to buy them. So he does what all the python owners in Florida do. He just opens the cage, and he lets them free. And that's how they got there. But I do have to say something. There, when, you see, I, when I first heard the term Gambian pouch rat, I thought it was like a, some sort of marsupial, like mm -hmm. they had a cute little, you know, like a little pouch, like a little wallaby or a little miniature kangaroo or something. And that's not how they got their name at all. Um, it, it was refers to the size of their cheeks. They have elastic, giant elastic cheeks that the, an adult male can put a, a, literally a pork chop in each cheek and run from your house with it. And so, but, so that's what Yancey's up against in this, in this. Bobby. Yeah, I know it's disgusting. Think, I'm sorry. And it, People are just <laughs> they're and, beyond. Be and all of this stuff you've heard, this is all in just the one book. Yeah. <laughs> this sorry. isn't like a series. This is all no. in just one book. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe but I ever did it a little. But the bit. the the yeah. beach the beach thing I guess is in some ways related to the rising sea. So it is. The, so when when Florida disappears, what state will you write about then? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I've thought about because Florida's it. been good to you. It has, and I mean, and you know, I, I seriously for a second, I have a lot of affection being born and raised down there, and I, I mean, and my family's still down there, my grandkids are down there, and I, I uh, and that's why I hang on to the newspaper column because I think that there's a lot of the places still worth fighting for, and those of you who go there on occasion know there's still some beautiful spots, so you don't want to give up and turn tail and run just yet, but once it's underwater, I'll have to make a decision, I guess. Um, yeah. I, I would, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of states, you know, that have uh, a lot of, you know, corruption and characters. I mean, Louisiana's pretty corrupt. I'm thinking um, Alabama's not great either in that department. There, there are places where I could go and have plenty of material, um, uh, but <laughs> it's not quite the same as Florida, I don't <laughs> think. No, and I'm hoping that it, at least until, you know, it, it it's around for, uh, at least in some form, for another couple of generations, at least from, until my grandkids can escape, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the, um, uh, I guess th this is what I was sort of wanted to get to now is, is, is um, sort of the current scene. I mean, and, mm. and you're still writing a column. The other thing I want to ask about, too, is you're still writing a column. Yeah. Is it weekly? Weekly, I write a Sunday for column for the paper. Not when I'm on the road, but when I'm there, I am. What's your, I mean, I spent... 
30 years working in newspapers, 27 of them at the Toronto Star. And it breaks my heart what's happened to newspapers. Yeah. What's your take? What do you see? I feel the same thing. And uh, I'll tell you why. And, and it's this conversion to sort of online news reporting, which was inevitable, I guess. The problem is that they can't monetize that in a way that, mm -hmm. uh, because ads that you see on the internet websites for newspapers or any internet web ads are, are, are purchased for much less money than a full display, you know, automobile ad in a newspaper. So they're not making the same revenue. So the result is they cut the staffs of the papers drastically, usually starting with the investigations team. Now, I'm not worried about, none of us have any problem getting sort of national news, either here in Canada or in, or in the United States. There's no shortage of national news, but where this is crippling to any sort of democratic process is your local reporting when you can't find out what happened at your own city council meeting or your co commission meeting or you know, provincial meeting, whatever it happens to be. You, you need reporters on the ground with notebooks who have some experience and some context because in Florida, for instance, Dade County I think has, I'm guessing, close to 60 different municipalities and they're all meeting and they're all making decisions that affect people's lives in those neighborhoods. And we don't have 60 reporters to cover mm -hmm. all that. And so what that means is if you're a crooked politician or you're somebody who's owned by a lobbyist or a special interest group, whether it's big sugar, whether it's oil companies, whatever, the fracking industry, whatever it happens to be, um, it's, this is a field day for them because nobody's watching. These decisions are getting made in public meetings and we don't have reporters to get there. And you can't rely on bloggers because, and people, because a lot of the information that comes spewing into the internet is just plain wrong. Um, they can hold a meeting and vote on something, and if you don't know what you're watching, you think they're voting the right way, then you read the motion again. And you can only do that if you've had some experience. Say, wait a minute, they just approved, they're gonna, they're gonna bulldoze this, this meadow and put a Walmart here, and those people that live in that neighborhood are gonna find out when the, when the bulldozers show up. Mm -hmm. Why? Because nobody, no, there are no reporters to cover it. That's the real tragedy of this. It's not that they're laying off people, not that journalists are out of work, that's sad enough, but the idea that you can't get information. It's, I know when you were reporting, you know, it's the most basic thing in the world. When you go home tonight on your street, wherever you live, you see a police car and an ambulance go flying by or a fire truck. You're, you're going to turn to your spouse, your loved one, or whatever, and say, I wonder what happened and you'll look down the street to see, and you'll wonder what happened. And in the old days, there would be a reporter who would be writing mm -hmm. about that, and you'd find out about what, you'd find out exactly what happened. And, and because that's the nature of news. It's what's your, going on in your neighborhood, your town, your city, your county. And that's not getting reported that much anymore. And that's, that's where some of these guys, at least in our country, where the corruption is just going nuts. It's going crazy, because nobody's watching them. You see any kind of answer? I don't. I mean, I wish I did. I think that the rise of the citizen journalist is important, and that's the people who, who, who will call you and say, I was at this meeting, I don't know what happened, or will go to the meetings and bring friends and raise hell about something that's going on, and that's when you hear about it. The sort of the citizen journalist with the iPad or the, or the mm -hmm. cell phone, uh, and you get tips that way, but you still need the, the manpower to chase them down. So I don't know the answer, but until they find a way to sort of to monetize the, the Internet distribution of news beyond just a little subscription fee that you pay to look at the, the star. I don't know if, if you have it, but the Herald now has a little portal gateway where you pay some modest mm -hmm. amount to, to see the newspaper, to see all of the newspaper. I mean, I don't know how the business model is going to work. I just know what's going to happen because it's been happening in Florida for a long, long time with vigilant journalism, with investigative reporters watching, and now without them, I, it's, they're going to go nuts. Back in the uh, end of July, you did a column about Donald Trump. I think this was post-convention. Yeah. Uh, after his, you know, trashing a military family, mm -hmm. um, uh, saying that a Mexican judge was, was, it couldn't judge him. Because, you know, he had a very bad run. Of yeah, just he did. One stupid thing after another. And you wrote, you, you speculated whether he was trying to sabotage his own campaign because he really didn't want to win. Do you yeah. still think that? I think he wants to win, but I don't think he wants the job. Yeah. Be because, it, you know what, it's really hard work to be president. Uh, and you've got to actually show up, and you can't play golf a lot, and, you gotta, and, you gotta, and there's a lot of people that don't like America. It's, your job, it's a nightmare job. 
And the other thing is it's a step down for him in terms of income because, mm -hmm. uh, and his lifestyle, I mean, the, the, I, I wrote in the column, I think the, the, the entertainment budget for the President of the United States is something around $18,000 a year, and Donald Trump spends more than that um, just, you know, lunch. On, a, on lunch, on <laughs> party night. Also, the other thing is I don't think his wife, I'm serious, I don't think she wants any part of this. I mean, what would you, which I think she'd rather be in the penthouse on Fifth Avenue mm -hmm hanging out with Tom Brady and Giselle, rather than, you know, you know here's, here's the vice minister of Latvia, would you, you have a state dinner? She's probably going, oh, just shoot me. I don't want to even do that. Well, you know, well um, I, I, who I, wouldn't, though, in that yeah, circumstance? Yeah, yes. who wouldn't? But, but, but seriously, I, I think it's all about the winning for him, and it's mm -hmm. the branding. It's just a brand that he's pushing, um, and it's him. He is the brand. Uh, but I think that he, when he, in his, if he has the, any deep thoughts, I think that when he does have them, he realizes this is going to be a rough for you. I'm 70 years old, and now I've got to live in a place that's not nearly as nice. And there's no gold, there's no gold headboards on the bed. There's not a gold toilet seat. What the hell am I going to do? Uh, you know, I mean, it's really going to be a change of lifestyle for him. Um, and uh, I, th I think that. I, I think that he would like to win, and then he's just going to not be very happy when, if he has to actually do the job. Well, they, it was um, Kasich had claimed, John Kasich had claimed that Trump's people had come to him and said, if you run for vice president, once you know, Trump <laughs> yeah. wins, you'll basically be handling foreign and domestic policy, which yeah. basically is all policy. <laughs> yeah, meaning all policy. And, yeah. uh, and I believe that story. I, I, don't, I don't disbelieve it at all. I think yeah. that uh, you know, this is just, right now it's a high because he, he spends a lot of his campaign money renting big auditoriums and having these rallies. And because it's a big ego thing and he gets the crowd he wants and he can say, you know, he can, he can absolutely say what he wants about immigration. I'm going to build that wall, which is nonsense. He's not going to build any wall. Um, it'll never get built. And, uh, but he can say it, and, yeah, he's going to build a wall. And these, you know, these folks, I feel bad for them because I think there are some people who actually believe he's going to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are people who just hate Hillary Clinton so much they would vote for anybody um, but, but Hillary Clinton. I mean, I have friends like that. They can't stand Donald Trump. They're Republicans. They can't stand him, but they, they can't stand her worse. So they're going to, they're going to vote for Donald Trump. Um, but there are others out there that I think he's appealed to, and, and, and the Buck Nances uh, mm -hmm. of the world, the wannabes, who he is now uh, given a home to hate. I mean, what I'm saying by that, I mean, is there's a reason the Ku Klux Klan likes Donald mm -hmm. Trump and the white Aryan nation. And, and he, he can say all he wants to, well, I'm not appealing to them. He hasn't really disavowed them completely. There's a reason. I mean, I tell people, look, if you grew up white in the United States of America, whether it was in the 40s, 50s, 60s, so whenever, as I did, you know personally some bigots. We all do. We all know some bigots. And so my test is go to, your, go to the people you know who are bigots, and you know they are, and say, ask them who they're voting for. Guess who they're voting mm -hmm. for. They're voting for that guy. It doesn't mean you're a bigot, but I'm saying that he has given a home to these kinds of people. And you can see it in the internet. The, the stuff online is very disturbing. Um, the kind of people that are sort of rallying to him it, 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 this is, uh, it's not good. It's not good for the country. It's not good for the hemisphere. Um, you know, we got enough people who hate our guts already. <laughs> I mean, you know, some with some justification. So, uh, you know, this is not going to be a, a good thing if he wins. I don't know that he will, but Florida, sadly, looks like it's going to be a swing state again. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. You know, every four years we go through this nightmare that it's going to come down to us again. Like it was Bush versus. It's going to be more uh, more hanging chads. We always <laughs> we pray we pray Floridians pray that it's somebody it's some other state that decides this because we <laughs> after what happened in 2000 I tell people we feel lucky they even let us vote after that <laughs> we feel lucky we don't want any responsibility for picking the next leader of the United States just let it be Ohio or Pennsylvania another swing state don't have it be Florida here's the other thing with this threat of Russian hackers which mm -hmm. I think is real uh, the, the, if you're the Russians and you're looking for a state to hack wh what's your first choice gonna be 
<laughs> you're going to look at a map and you go, these numbnuts in Florida. No one will believe that we're hacking because they screw it up even when we're not hacking them. <laughs> I think we've we reached the point where we want to do some, some we're, going to, we're going to take, we've got a bit of time, we're going to take a few questions from the audience if we have any. Um, the rat I, story killed you know, I have to tell they're you that I've been, <laughs> I've been getting uh, the occasional email and Facebook message and so forth from people who live south of the border asking that if the election goes a certain way in November, can they come up and move in with us? All right. And I say, take a number. <laughs> <laughs> because there's quite a few, it seems. I, st I was on a radio show today, and I said, or it was a TV or something, I don't know what it was, well, something, they, they asked me about it, and I said, if, if he wins, uh, uh, Canadian real estate prices are going to go through the roof. <laughs> it, 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 the places I would invest, Canada and the Bahamas. Watch what happens because there's going to be lots of people bailing out. Yes? If Trump wins, which I hope doesn't happen, but if he does, do you think the presidency will become a reality show? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do think, yeah, that's a good question. If Trump wins, well, does the presidency become a reality show? I think he'll turn it into one because that's the only stage he's comfortable on. He's not comfortable in any kind of serious uh, format. I mean, I think everybody, everything will be a performance uh, for a while. But I think he's going to run into a Congress, even though it's re probably Republican, that's going to that's going to tear him up pretty badly. I think he's got he's made so many enemies and. Uh, I, I think it's, it's going to be a rough reality show, but I do think it will be. And, and maybe that's what, if we vote for this guy, maybe that's what we deserve. I mean, you know, we're, we, don't have the, we don't have a monopoly on these kinds of uh, gas bags. I mean, you know, <laughs> Rob Ford, I mean, uh, <laughs> okay? I mean, it's, uh, we, we've all got our burdens, you know? <laughs> yes? Uh, okay, yeah, uh, I first visited Key West in 1967, and I um, actually got married there, but when we were there, Sloppy Joe's was still something of a pirate bar, and when we would go there and sit around for an hour listening to music, over an hour, I don't know who hijacked the sound system, but we would hear Roland the Headless Thompson Gunner, four out of five songs. <laughs> now, it was, I still love the song and everything, but what I'd ask from you, because I know you have a, a connection with Warren Zevon, maybe uh, yeah. if you could just give us an anecdote or two about Warren, or even like a couple of my other Florida musicians, Fred Warren, Neal or Warren yeah, Silverstein. He was, but, if, he, but if you just a little, an anecdote or two. Well, he was a dear friend of mine. He showed up at a book signing, and Warren Zevon, the, 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 the songwriter, and he, and he showed up at a book signing in LA one day uh, because I had mentioned, I had a character mention his music fondly in one of the novels, and he showed up to thank me. It scared me, because you never knew Warren's reputation being what it is, what the deal was. And he showed up, and we went out and had coffee, and we became friends. And all he wanted to talk about was writing. He read everything. He was the most literate guy. I mean, he, was, he read all kinds of stuff. He, we talked about lyric writing. I'm not a musician. I, 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 I can't play an instrument or anything. But we, we just talked and talked, and we became friends. And uh, he, was, um, he, was, he was a character. And uh, the only, well, there are a lot of anecdotes. I'm trying to think of the ones I can talk, tell you. But I remember I went to. Um, I'll tell you one funny thing that he used to do. I went to see a concert of his in New Orleans, and uh, I think I was between marriages at the time, and Warren thought he was doing me a favor. <laughs> uh, backstage, he said, I got someone I want you to meet. And I should have known, because I'd seen him in action before, I should have known where the, this was leading. So he said, and he had already found a friend, and I, I thought we were gonna like hang out. He, did, he wasn't drinking at the time, I just thought we'd go out or something. He vanishes, uh, probably, into the tour bus with the friend. And I'm left with this woman who, uh, she is, uh, she, as we, in the South, we call them gentlemen's clubs. You might call them strip joints. We call them gentlemen's clubs. She worked, she was a dancer at a gentleman's club, but she moonlighted as a psychic for the New Orleans Police Department. <laughs> And that's, that's who was, a, that's my anecdote, that's who was attracted, that was the Zevon entourage. You know. and, today, and today that woman's name is Mrs. Hyacinth. No, 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 the, the evening didn't go well. <laughs>
Uh, it, didn't, it didn't go well for me. Um, and, I, and things kept happening, and then I said, if you're a psychic, why didn't you know that was going to happen? <laughs> um, anyway, I, yeah, I, Warren and I had a talk about it afterwards. But anyway, he was, he was a wonderful guy. He was a brilliant songwriter, terrific songwriter, and also a good friend. One of the great perks of my this job that we have is we find ourselves getting letters and from you know uh, musicians apparently have a lot of time on the tour bus and they read a lot so I I've heard from I mean I've just got made friends with a lot of people that I as as a kid growing up that I admired and I you know I mean uh, you know Jackson Brown and David Crosby and Roger McGuinn of the Birds and these people and they read your books and 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 they send you notes, and it's kind of a cool thing. You know, it's like you're a kid all over again. You can and be you know, a fan. And Warren Zavon was friends with, and actually, I think, had a kind of a relationship where, with Ross MacDonald. Very much so. The, the yeah. author of the Lou Archer novels. And I think, I think actually went to him, at counseling would be the wrong word, but kind of, he needed somebody to talk to. And Ross MacDonald, whose real name was Kenneth Miller, became that person for him yeah, for a he, while. Yeah, he was a huge fan of Ross yeah. MacDonald. Yeah, he read, he read, he had a lot of friends. The trouble with Warren was, you know, when he got sick, whenever he got sick, he had, a lot, he had a OCD and he had a lot of, you know, things. He, 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 if you brought him, if he asked for a Coca-Cola, he would open seven Coca-Colas before he got the right Coca-Cola. You know, it's a, it's a serious disorder, I'm serious. But he would, um, uh, and I mean, he, when he got sick, he, he distrusted doctors. So whenever he got sick, he would go to his dentist. He would go to his dentist. If he had some, and the dentist kept saying, I'm not a doctor. And he'd go, you're the only one I can talk to. And that's kind of the way. And so when he really got sick, and it was really serious, Stan, the dentist, sent him to a real doctor, and he got the bad news. But I mean, I, it was, he, he would always tell me, I'm on the road, I feel like, Crap! I'm gonna. I can't wait to see Stan when I get home. And I go, what? Don't, don't go to Stan. You don't have a toothache anyway. Now, if he had, if he actually had a sore tooth, would he also go to him? <laughs> I, I'm sure. I don't know. I mean, and he, yeah. And I mean, his big thing with Stan was he was so excited because Stan was George Harrison's dentist, and so that you know, I mean, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I mean actually, yeah, I would go to him too. I, I got a heart problem. I'm gonna go see Stan. So, in the absence of, we don't seem to have another person at the mic right now, but who's your, who's your all-time favorite writer? Who made the biggest impression on you? I mean, probably when you were growing up. When I was growing up, the biggest impression on me, gosh, that's good. I mean, I think that, when I think back to when I, when I was young, I read all the John D. McDonald books mm -hmm. because they were set in Florida, and yep. they were set in Lauderdale when I grew up, so I knew all the streets, and that was, and he got in a lot of pretty sly social commentary about the greed heads in Florida long before it was him, so I think he was a big influence, but I think the one book that maybe shook me up uh, in a great way and opened my eyes about the possibilities was Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. Mm -hmm. Because uh, my dad had given that to me and I said, oh God, I don't want to read a book about, you know, war. I mean, that's a bummer and I was just a kid. Uh, but I'd already been trying to write little things and he said, you got to read this. And it was, of course, genius. And you were mm -hmm. laughing on every page and it was the grimmest of human conditions, which is the war, but I thought, it's possible to do this. It's possible to write about something important to you and still have people laugh and still do your writer's job, which is to entertain people. That's our job, is to entertain mm -hmm. people. I don't care what they say. Uh, it's not to preach. It's not to change people's minds. It's to entertain. And if you can, along the way, get in, get in your uh, few licks, that's even better. So I read that book and I thought, man, this is it. there are interesting possibilities. Yesterday I picked up um, Doonesbury's collection of Donald Trump co oh, cartoons. Oh, God, I haven't looked at it yet. Called Huge. <laughs> and it's so present. But, but I, and I read almost, I went through almost half of all the strips today and as I was getting ready to come to this today. And as I was reading, I thought, this is Carl Hyacin with pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's high praise. He's a great, he's a terrific uh, cartoonist in the material. You know, we live in as a very... Uh, you know, it's a, an alarming time. And I think people, in, at least in our country this year, desperately need to laugh. Um, and the book signings I've done on, you know, you do these tours and, and, and you find that people are just there because they are desperate in need. They, they want to feel like they're not the only ones who are worried, scared, shaken up, whatever. And uh, so it's nice to be able to make them laugh. And, and even the kids who show up, if I, 
and I do try to clean up my act when there's kids around. I probably failed tonight, but um, <laughs> well, yeah. Carl, you may, you've been making us laugh for a very long time. You've been making me laugh since the night shift and the star. It's since <laughs> 1981. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Oh, I think we've, yes, we've we will end on laughter. That's now. always thank a good you. place. Thank you, man. Okay. Thanks.